We are good to go. Okay, sweet. Everyone be quiet because I want to talk about counterplans. Cool. What is counterplan? JP. Someone put it in different words. Yes. Okay. Wiley. Something I hate. <laughs> well, then you're going to hate this lecture. <laughs> Yeah, Gabe. Cool. Yeah, an, an alternative that, like Blake said, is the policy against the negative team. And like we talked about earlier with Isaiah's argument map, you as the negative are always running a counterplan. You're always proposing an alternative policy stance than that of the affirmative team. Something to keep in mind as we're going through these. So there's lots of different categories of counterplans. Someone tell me what a non-topical counterplan is. Yeah, Noah. The only thing we can run is CC of SC. Uh, okay, a Do definition of it. Lately. Yeah, Tucker. Oh um, I would probably say that it is a competitive counterplan that is mutually exclusive, yet not inside the resolution. Okay. Yeah, is that what you're going to say? Sweet. Any, any objections to that? Cool. What's a topical counterplan? Very basic. Yeah, Chris. What's a plan inclusive counterplan? <laughs> really? Okay, that's interesting. Blake? Yeah. Cool. What's a uniqueness counterplan? Cool. Ty's going to talk about that in a minute. So, okay, basic categories that we just walked through. So first you get the non-topical counterplans, which you guys already laid it out. But basically, at, its, at the core of it, it's solving the problem in a way that doesn't affirm the resolution. Okay, same with topical counterplans, except you're just rejecting the affirmative team's policy and proposing a policy stance that is within the resolution. Plan-inclusive counterplans. There's a lot of different plan-inclusive counterplans that people will propose. So the first and probably the one that you'll get a fair amount of time if you ever come up against a plan inclusive counterplan is that of an alternative agent where they basically say instead of using the FEC to implement this or enforce it, let's use the DOJ or the DOD or whatever. Just insert alternate agent to enforce your policy. Does that make sense? Really, really basic. It's basically saying we don't like your enforcement. Let's pick someone else to be the agent. Yeah, Noah. Okay, but how, I, I miss, what, what does your first sentence have to relate? Like, you can have plan exclusive counterplan for a topical and not for topical. Those kind of counterplans are, those types of counterplans are completely exclusive. Yeah. 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 Y
Say the affirmative gets up and they read a case to intervene in Syria as the United States and try and either oust Assad or beat ISIS, something along those lines. If you want an alternate agent counterplan, you could argue that NATO or UN peacekeepers should do that and then argue that those entities have a comparative advantage over the United States in solving major conflicts. Your best bet would probably be the Arab League because they're an indigenous fighting force. Battle. Yeah. All right. Is that better? Yeah. Better. Sweet. So a consult counterplan is so if you were going to go into Afghanistan or Iraq or something like that, a consult counterplan would would say, let's talk to Pakistan first, and if they say sure, then we go for it, and if they say no, then we don't. Okay. That's basically what a consult counterplan is. Is you're consulting with some other agency. Generally, it's a country before you do X policy. Generally, that's coupled with like a relations disadvantage or something like that. If we just went in without asking, they would hate us, kind of a thing. So plan minus is basically the mandate minus a couple portions. So for for a case that cuts all of our aid to Israel, a plan minus counter plan would be something like cut just cut military aid or just cut humanitarian aid or something like that. So you're not doing the full mandate, just part of it. Plan plus is where you say you do the plan and then just add on something more, generally in the same line of thought. So if it was to cut aid to Israel, your, your plan plus counter plan could be cut aid to every country in the Middle East or something like that. Yeah, on plan plus counter plans, the overwhelming consensus is that they're illegitimate. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. Yeah. No, a plan minus counter plan is a counter plan where you get up and you say, the affirmative team's plan is doing too much. So take mandates three and four and strike them because of these disadvantages. I ran several of these counter plans back in Biomet here. There were all these teams that would get up and they would cut federal energy subsidies. And they'd say wind subsidies fail, solar subsidies fail, and then I think something to do with batteries, battery subsidies fail. And we had all this great evidence about how the battery subsidies were crucial to next generation automotive cars. So we would argue these batteries are important. If we cut them, it leads to these disadvantages. And we counter plan with cut these wasteful subsidies, but keep this one, because this is a useful problem. Um, that sounds interesting, but at plan well, I mean, wouldn't it, the more mandates you add that fix stuff, isn't that better? No, not necessarily. If you're cutting, think of it this way. What plan minus counter plans do is they force the affirmative team to justify every single one of their mandates. Okay. It forces them to have a logical rationale and a comparing, compelling benefit for each mandate. And it puts them in a really awkward position because you're saying most of their case is a good idea. And just arguing that cost benefit wise, it's better to be part of this plan. They tend to be really effective at the beginning of the year and then less effective as the year progresses because the affirmative team realize, oh yeah, perhaps we ought to justify our entire policy instead of only part of it. Study counter plan is basically you say, let's study the issue for six months or a year before we implement your policy because there hasn't been enough research into it, or generally that's the standard reason. There can be a couple others. But my basically, oh, sorry, go yeah, ahead. My favorite example of this was also from environment here. There was a several great teams in our region, and one of them showed up to uh, a tournament in Arkansas. There were several teams that had come up with this new case to ban carbon nanotubes. <coughs> And my partner and I, we had no idea what banning carbon nanotubes were. But we walked into the round anyway, and we were thrown with this case, and there was a bunch of evidence that made carbon nanotubes sound really scary. The affirmative team talked about how carbon nanotubes are structurally similar to asbestos. You guys know what asbestos is? Yes. yes major cancer-causing substance that has led to huge lawsuits. So they were arguing these, this new technology is similar to asbestos if people inhale it, they might die. And my partner and I were sitting back at the table. We've got no evidence on this. Uh, it looks like bad news for us. 
But we ask for the 1AC and we start reading through their evidence. And there's, they have a lot of great inflammatory cars, but very few warrants. And none of their evidence contains any studies that have been done linking carbon nanotubes to any sort of harm. So we counterplan with a study counterplan and say, look, the affirmative team's evidence includes absolutely no empirical data on the impact of carbon nanotubes on human health or the environment. So we ran a study counterplan to have the National Academy of Sciences, the EPA, and the FDA all create independent studies on the effects of carbon nanotubes on human health and the environment, and then report to Congress. If they concluded that carbon nanotubes were harmful, go ahead and pass the affirmative plan. If they concluded they weren't, don't pass the affirmative plan, don't create a new government regulation and potentially stifle an entire sector of the economy, and then we had a second disadvantage that links to competition with China and other major developed countries. So it all ended up working out in the end, despite the fact that we had no evidence for anything we were talking about. Cool. Any questions on the study counterplan? Yeah, Chris. The, a very similar situation happened to me in the STEM finals. Um, at, our, at our club stream, the, the guy that I was debating had a fantastic case I'd never heard about. The problem was all this, the, the tag for my main argument was the experts were unsure. His, his evidence, the experts were very vague in what they said, so I just ran it as a solvency argument. But I certainly could have run it as a study counterplan. What would be the advantage of running it as a counterplan versus a solvency argument? The advantage of running a counterplan in general is it gives the judge something to grasp onto. They get to vote for something instead of against something.